Sorry, I'm just having a little bit of mic. Okay, there we go. I think, I think we're good. Hi, everyone. My name is Adrian, and I'm a consultant for Tourism Cares. Tourism Cares is a 501c3 based out of Boston. And what we do is we try to convene the entire tourism industry to help people and places thrive. And I'm so excited to talk to you today about creating opportunities for women in travel. The tourism industry is a huge economic engine. It creates 10% of all economic activity in the world. That's one in 10 jobs related to tourism. $200 billion are spent in emerging market destinations every single year. The workforce the global workforce is made up of 66% women, and in tourism, the workforce is made up of 55% women. That's more women than men. 66 million women are employed in the tourism industry. However, we still face many barriers, many challenges in order to really have a, a gender equal world. Take this statistic, for example. We still only make globally 77 cents to the dollar for men for doing the exact same job. There is much improvement, opportunity, respect and resource management that needs to occur for us to truly have a gender equal world. But the tourism industry can help with that. The tourism industry can help spread these resources, diversify income, bring women into the formal economy. It's the only industry in the whole world where there are more women and minority groups employed than in any other sector or industry. That's pretty powerful stuff. So how can we create more opportunities for women in the tourism industry? And how can you help support these women in the tourism industry? Well, the tourism industry creates and supports many transferable skills. It creates homegrown skills that can be transferred into dignified livelihoods all around the world. Take, for example, my friends here from AFER. AFER stands for the Association des Femmes et Enfants Ruelles, or the Association for Rural Women and Children. This is Nadia, Waifa, Leila, and Hanan that I met in Morocco. They're members of AFER. AFER is a nonprofit organization that's helping over a thousand women and children access free education and healthcare in rural Mahoya, Morocco. Now, Mahoya is located between Meknes and Fez, two prime tourist destinations that when people are traveling to Morocco, they go visit but it's farmland in between. So what AFER is trying to do is they're trying to benefit homegrown skills where women can work from home, still care for their children, doing handicraft work and then being able to take these handicrafts to market. And the association helps them to do this. They've also developed their first hospitality program in the association's headquarters. These women come every day between the hours of 10 to 2.30 while their children are at school they go and shop for local ingredients at the local market. And then they share their traditional recipes, like this delicious chicken tagine. And I've been all over Morocco, and this was the best meal I've ever had. And they share this with international travelers that are stopping from when they're leaving Meknes and on their way to Fez for traditional lunch. Now, all this money goes back to helping the association, helping to provide free health care, helping to provide emergency health care and education for these children and for these families. The tourism industry also supports businesses that are bringing women into the formal economy. It fosters entrepreneurship and has a low barrier to entry. Take, for example, Juana here. So Juana, like many women around the world, were part of the informal labor sector. She would survive off subsistent agriculture most of her days, but with climate change really sort of having inclement weather patterns on her community, she can't necessarily rely on being able to get to the next season. She saw many tourists coming into her community, visiting the beautiful Lake Atitlan. She lives in a community called San Juan La La Laguna in Guatemala. She wanted to be part of this tourism industry. She saw that the money was coming in, but it wasn't really staying within her community. People would come, they would visit the beautiful lake, and then they would leave right away because there wasn't any accommodations for people to stay in to have more of an immersive experience in her community. 
So she got together with 25 other women, and she formed the Posadas Mayas, which means the Mayan homestay slash inn. Her with 25 other women were granted a grant from the Inter-American Development Bank, and they were able to do small renovations to their homes. They received capacity training in sanitation and hygiene, hospitality, English, financial literacy, and they started their own homestay program. Now hundreds of travelers are staying with them every single month. It's a way for them to diversify their income, and they'll have income that they can rely on during seasons where climate change has really affected their crops. The added infrastructure to her, her home also benefits her family as well. Because they had to put in clean water tanks so that travelers had a clean source of water, she noticed too that her children were getting less sick. Her children were stopped having gastrointestinal diseases, and st which was stopping them from attending school on most days of the month. Now she sees her kid go to school every single day with very rare times that her kids are getting sick. She's able to save this money and use this towards her children's education and her children's health. She's also able to share with travelers her cultural textiles that she makes at home, and she can sell these to travelers as well. The tourism industry can also create non-traditional livelihoods for women. It's breaking down gender norms and creating new, new forms of futures for these women. This is a program that I really love in India. This is the Azad Foundation. The Azad Foundation is a nonprofit organization that's working to create non traditional livelihoods for women. They provide social services, capacity training, and access to the market. And their signature program here is called Women on Wheels. They're working with resource poor women around India to develop their skills through an 18 month training program. These women go through defensive driving, CPR training, hospitality, English lessons, and they become professional chauffeurs up to the point where they're, they're driving their own customers around the city. They pick up other single females that are looking for a safe way to travel in India. Um, they started off working with tech companies and, and females that were working late into the night and quickly branched off into the tourism industry as well because there's so many single females traveling to India. It's such a great way to travel. Women gain confidence, dignity, new life sources. These women prior to going through this program were making around $30 a month for a family of six. After going through this program, they're making about $300 a month, 10 times what they were making before, and they become the primary breadwinners in their families. I heard one story of one of these women that was so dependent on the male counterparts in her family that she hadn't even crossed the street by herself before. And then once going through this program, she's now driving strangers all over the city, and she's gained full independence and full control of her life again. And she's become the leader and the model for her daughters for the future. You can also support businesses that are helping to keep families together. Unfortunately, the responsibilities of caring for families often falls to the female of the household. And this is often when women drop out of their, their business to raise their family. But we can support businesses that are helping to keep women in the workforce by providing on-site childcare. This is a wonderful cafe just outside of the Maasai Mara. You'll pass it if you fly into Kenya and then you're going into the Maasai Mara, called Cafe Ubuntu. They have a cafe on site that sells delicious food as well as a factory that employs over 600 women in, in high-end handicrafts. They have formed partnerships with global partners from around the world, in, including American Eagle and Whole Foods. So you can even support these women by just purchasing these products without even traveling. All the proceeds from these products go to help support the on-site childcare, the Center to Develop Women, as well as education for children living with disabilities, as well as job opportunities for adults living with disabilities. So it's a really wonderful social enterprise that you can help support by just having a meal at this cafe. The tourism industry also helps with preserving culture. It's one of the few industries that's able to get to some of the most remote and, and tiny villages in the world. We're literally bringing customers and travelers to these tiny communities. It's creating job opportunities for the next generation of youth 
by creating local opportunities, such as being a local guide, a homestay host, or as part of uh, a, the textile business. It's also giving choice as well. These skills are transferable that youth can stay in their community or they can go to the next urban center to work. These are skills that are highly valued all over the world. Take, for example, this community in Mehong San, Thailand. This is a black Lahu community who for so long wanted to be part of the tourism industry but just didn't have the market access um, to be able to access these customers. Now they're able to host travelers within their home through a homestay network that they've developed with another Lahu community and a white Karen community. It's bringing peace and, and camaraderie to different ethnic minorities in Thailand as they work together to develop a really solid homestay program. It's also creating jobs for their youth to stay in the community to learn about the local textile business so that these traditions aren't lost. Some regions are really doing it right as well. In Africa, over a third of the Minister of Tourism's are female. And in Asia, there's a significant portion of female tourism professionals. And as I look around the room today, that is so evident and it's so wonderful to see. In Oceania, they're doing a great job fostering female leaders in tourism because they have great university programs. And in the Caribbean, a male and a female will be paid the same amount of money for the same role. They have gender equal pay there. So I love this quote. The world needs more dreamers and the world needs more doers, but the world needs more dreamers that do. So let me share with you some of the women that I have met on my journeys that are my dreamers that do. This is Minu. Minu, she would be mortified if I was highlighting her right now because she's so humble. But she is the founder of the Azad Foundation and Sakai Consulting Wings. So she's responsible for the Women on Wheels program. She was working in Kenya for about 10 years as part of the Action Network and then came back to her home country, India, to realize that something needs to be done to really create a more gender equal India. She created the Women on Wheels program as an access point into creating more um, dignified livelihoods for women, and she has helped support thousands of women across her country. She's created programs in Delhi, in Chennai, in Kolkata, um, and it's only expanding. And they most recently won a Booking Cares Award for 350,000 euros to help support this program to push it global. She's also responsible for training the first ever female truck driver in India. And this is Indira. Indira is the president of Sasane, which is a nonprofit organization that stands for Shamarakshak Samuha Nepal, which means let us help ourselves. She was a survivor of trafficking, and what she noticed was when girls were coming into police stations, it was often the girls that were convicted and not the pimps. She wanted to break this cycle of corruption, so she started Sasane, and she started to take survivors of trafficking and she started to train them to become paralegals. Now, these paralegals would be placed in police stations all over the Kathmandu Valley, and when another victimized woman would come into the station, their first point of access was another woman that had gone through the same history that she had gone through. What she noticed, though, was that so many girls that were coming into her doors didn't have the, high school, the minimum of a high school level of education to become a paralegal, because they had been trafficked before they even got to high school. So she wanted to find a means to make sure that they're entering the formal economy, that they're entering dignified work without having to go back and be pimped out by a pimp. So she developed a program called the Sisterhood of Survivors, an entry point into the tourism economy. Travelers come to the Sasani headquarters, which is just a small office in Kathmandu. It's based out of a house. And they learn from the Sisterhood of Survivors, other survivors of trafficking, how to make traditional momos or dumplings. It's a delicious way to learn about some really critical issues in Nepal. They share a tali, and they get to learn about what a perspective and a story in Nepal that they don't often hear about, um, especially as a tourist, which is also helping to advocate for their research. All of their money that com comes in through this lunch program is pr creating job opportunities for these ladies. It also helps to further their paralegal training, their education work, their outreach work, and their justice work around Nepal. They actually won, a few years back, the UNWTO Award for the most innovative social enterprise in tourism. She's also the mother of two. And this is a soup pet. 
A soup pad is a clean cook stove engineer. Stoves in sub-Saharan Africa often leave smoke within the household. It is the fifth largest killer in sub-Saharan Africa and the primary killer for a child under five. The soup pad has learned to make clean cook stoves out of local materials that she sources in her community, and she installs chimneys throughout her bomas in the communities that she works with. She teaches other women how to be clean cook stove engineers as well. And she became so good at this that the Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves actually flew her to Uganda to teach other women there as well. She was the first person in her entire community of 50,000 people to leave her village and to get on an airplane. So her nickname is actually Airplane. <laughs> She's a lifesaver to thousands. Now, she started a hospitality program in her community as well. Tourists can come in, they can see what a boma is like without a clean cook stove. Immediately, your eyes start to water, you start to cough from the secondhand smoke. And then she takes you into a boma where they're installing a clean cook stove. You can see the pride the family takes into um, preserving their house. It's quite the experience. And for every group that visits her community, a clean co cook stove is purchased by the house that doesn't have one. It's a wonderful way to see the local culture, the local community, interact with actual local people, but to be able to invest in their community development as well. If men and women played identical roles in labor markets, 26% could be added to our global GDP by 2025. That's not even that far away. That's $28 trillion. And that's a lot of change and movement for everyone. So I'll leave you with this. When we invest in women, we invest in the people that invest in everyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian.